Uh, slithering right along, our final presenter is uh, Steve Passio, going to talk about forest birds. All right, thanks. Thanks, uh, Steve. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, I would say we're fluttering right along. Um, so I'm going to be uh, talking about some results from the Forest Bird Monitoring Program, um, the timing of this, uh, of this uh, uh, program today fits pretty nicely with, with uh, our forest bird monitoring program since we've been working on an analysis of 25 years of data. Uh, birds are our most diverse vertebrate group in our forested ecosystems and uh, bringing a lot of uh, pleasure to birders and, and the general public uh, as well as color and voice to the forest. And I think we'd all agree that forest birds need forests, um, but there's a growing body of evidence showing that forests also need birds for um, the role they play in providing a variety of ecosystem services from pollination and pest control to seed dispersal and nutrient cycling. So it's important to uh, monitor populations uh, as a step in gaining a broader understanding of uh, forest ecology. So the Vermont Forest Bird Monitoring Program was established in uh, 1989 with 11 study sites. And uh, it's, we, we added study sites over the years, so currently we have uh, 31. Um, all of the sites are located in unmanaged interior forest stands in an attempt to sort of limit uh, effects human-induced effects uh, of habitat change over time, and uh, as well as limiting edge effects. Uh, each site consists of five study points, um, spaced about 200 to 250 meters apart, at which 10-minute uh, point counts are conducted each year by uh, skilled birders. And at, when you survey those points, you're identifying every bird seen or heard in the 10 minute period. Uh, and we can kind of break our habitat types of our study sites into sort of four broad categories. As you might expect, northern hardwoods make up the majority of our study sites with a handful of oak maple sites and a handful of forested wetlands. So to estimate population trends, uh, we developed these mixed effect models in the program R using the uh, count of each species summed over all the survey sites as the response variable. And then we used a year as the fixed effect. And we included observer and site as random effects. And then we limited the analysis to just those species uh, that occurred uh, on at least five study sites with at least 100 individuals. So uh, we analyzed almost 2,500 point counts uh, where we detected a little over 32,000 birds of 125 species for a mean of about 13 birds per point. And we modeled trends for 34 species and 13 ecological guilds. And among the species, eight species increased significantly 13 declined significantly, and 13 showed no real trend. And among the ecological guilds, two increased significantly, seven decreased, and four showed no trend. So we have some good news and bad news. And uh, we'll start with the good news. Um, among all the, when you see all these charts, the vertical axis is the average number of birds per point, just plotted against year. Uh, so these four species, red-eyed vireo, yellow-bellied sapsucker, black-throated green warbler, and oven bird, are all increasing significant, significantly. And in the interest of time, I'm just going to focus on those species that we have the highest confidence in the, in the trend estimates for. Um, so here's, this is the good news. Um, good news for a variety of reasons. One. These four are among the most abundant species on our surveys. They're also really widely distributed on, on our survey sites and fairly easily detected by the observers. So we have a real high confidence level in these trends. 
They also occupy different habitats and ecological niches, suggesting that the forests are providing for a diversity of needs, ranging from canopy foragers to bark probers to ground foragers, um, uh, mixed forest species, deciduous forests, so a variety of a variety of ecological needs. And all four are listed as species of regional conservation concern by Partners in Flight, or PIF. Um, uh, so that's, that's good news uh, as well. But rapidly, we're on to the bad news. Uh, so these four species, Eastern Wood Peewee, Great Crested Flycatcher, Downy Woodpecker, and Blue Jay, all declining significantly. And the top two, Peewee and Great Crested Flycatcher, are uh, aerial insectivores, which have received a fair amount of attention over the last decade or so for, um, for region-wide and even broader declining trends. And in fact, it's one of our uh, ecological guilds that's declining quite precipitously. And the species listed there, those 11 species in the upper right, are the species included in this, in this guild, uh, most of which occur in pretty low levels on our survey sites. Um, with the exception of peewee, great crested flycatcher, and least flycatcher. So declining uh, as a group, most, most people are pointing to probably some kind of loss of prey, or uh, you know, these guys are feeding on aerial insects, um, or maybe it's a timing thing. Maybe it's the phenology of when the prey is emerging uh, during the breeding season. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is these low, uh, low counts on either side of 2000, which corresponds to uh, the time that West Nile virus arrived. Uh, and West Nile has been shown to affect some species pretty dramatically, especially blue jays and other corvids. Uh, so there could be an effect on, for some species of, on, uh, uh, due to West Nile virus. Uh, and eastern wood peewee is also a species of regional concern. Uh, these four, Viri, white-throated sparrow, common yellow-throat, and Canada warbler. On our surveys, these four reach their greatest abundance on our forest, forested wetland sites. Uh, you don't, I don't typically think of white-throated sparrow as a wetland species, but on our, on our survey sites, it's the most abundant uh, on our forested wetlands. So all four of these are, are wetland, are found in high abundance on our wetland sites, all declining. Um, and again, notice the West Nile virus signature. Uh, and if you would expect any habitat to be at high risk for West Nile, you would probably think of wetlands. Um, and all four of these are also um, either ground nesters or low, you know, low shrub nesters. So there may be some habitat change as well that's, that's going on. Unfortunately, three of them are also uh, PIF regional concern species. And Canada warbler is also considered a high priority species of greatest conservation need in the Vermont Wildlife Action Plan. <clears throat> and then these three, black burning warbler, winter wren, and yellow rump warbler, uh, on our surveys reach their greatest abundance on, in conifer wetlands. Uh, we don't have a, lo a lot of conifer wetlands survey sites, but um, they, these three are, are also declining. Um, and two, black burning warbler and winter wren are also conservation concern species. And winter wren is another you know, low either ground nester or shrub nester and forager. So um, five of these seven that we just talked about are all nesting or feeding on or near the ground. So there could be some kind of, uh, could be some kind of habitat change or habitat effect going on in these forested wetlands. So to kind of summarize the take home messages, we analyzed, 30, of the 34 species we analyzed and produced trends for, a quarter are increasing. Um, more than half of those are, are partners in flight priority species, and half are neotropical migrants. Um, more than a third of the species of those 34 species declined significantly. About half are PIF priorities, and more than half are neotropical migrants, which is a reminder just that, we, that this is pretty complex to determine, you know, what are driving these trends, because there are a lot of threats 
that these migrants face either during their migration or on their wintering grounds or on, at stopover sites. So there's more that can be limiting uh, populations than just things that are going on in the breeding grounds. Uh, West Nile virus may be affecting some species, may have knocked some species back, some may have recovered pretty dramatically, while others may be still feeling the effects of West Nile virus. A relatively high proportion of forested wetland birds are declining, 70% um, of which are ground or shrub nesters and feeders. So there may be a change in some understory structure uh, and could, could these forested wetlands be high-risk habitats for West Nile virus. Um, we've had a lot of great funding support over the years, including VMC. I just want to acknowledge the funders that helped us uh, uh, help to support this 25-year analysis and acknowledge our small army of birders who have contributed all this data. We couldn't have done it uh, without their help. Thanks a lot.